All right, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, this is, again, Jonathan Sue from Zarian Software. I'm here with Lisa Smith. She's going to be hosting and fielding questions today on our December edition of the Community Form Building Webinar. Uh, thank you so much for joining, everyone. This is the last Community Form Building Webinar we'll be doing in 2018. So I appreciate everybody's continued uh, attentiveness and, and dedication to the webinar. We've had really great numbers, a lot of really good participation throughout the year, and I think that it's paid dividends for a lot of people learning how to do the, the form building and enhancing their skills. Before we get started, I wanted to go through a couple of quick updates uh, just to keep everybody in the loop. If you have not already, I recommend you follow our different blog series. We have a few of them. The first one is our official Zarian blog, which can be found at blog.zariansoftware.com. That's titled the Data Management Digest. On Medium, we also have two blog series dedicated to our engineering team as well as our customer success team. So I would uh, encourage you to check those out as well. And then finally, if you have not already, please jump onto our community and, and post and read what's going on there. Uh, feature requests and general questions, it's a great source of knowledge there, uh, especially a lot of the form building techniques and challenges certain people run into. Uh, we'll answer them there. And so it's a really great repository of past knowledge. So if you're trying to figure something out, there's a good chance somebody else has had that challenge in the past, and they may have posted there, and you'll be able to find the answers you're looking for. If you don't already, please follow us on social media. Uh, we have a YouTube channel, which is where all of these past webinars are held as well. We're going to be uploading the recording of the webinar in the next 48 hours, next couple of days, uh, and then you'll be able to find previous recordings for all the other webinars that we've done. You'll also be able to find us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram as well. Now, I mentioned that this is the last webinar in terms of community form building for the year, but it is not the last Zarian webinar for all of 2018. We will be doing a webinar on December 13th. This is going to be an introduction to web forms. Now, if you are a, an existing customer, you may have heard about web forms throughout this year. This has been our big project throughout 2018, and we're really happy with the, pro the progress we've made and where things are right now. Um, if you are newer to Zarian software and you may have come to us by looking up mobile data collection, what we're also doing is introducing the ability to fill out these forms on a mobile desktop, so in your browser effectively. Uh, what we found is this is a critical component to some of the workflows that people use where you may have a controller who's, who's sitting at home base, uh, assigning records out, QAing the data, it basically opens up a couple of different workflows that you're able to leverage now. And in fact, what we're gonna be doing with today's webinar is using web forms to demonstrate the form building as we go through this. So you'll get a sneak peek at it. But if you wanna learn more, I would highly recommend you register for that webinar. Again, it's on December 13th, and we're going to be doing a much deeper dive into web forms so you can learn more about it. Before we get into the meat of today's webinar, what I wanna do is launch a couple of quick polls. This first poll is just asking simply if you are a current user or not. I like to always get a sense for the viewership during each webinar. It allows me to tailor the content a little bit more closely to the audience. So we'll leave this open for a couple of seconds. And we're looking pretty good. Let me go ahead and close this poll out. Now it looks like we have a... Uh, a strong number of people who have active form builder accounts, but we also have a very large number of people who are here just checking things out or have an active trial. For those of you, welcome. Uh, it's great to have you joining onto this webinar to learn more about iForm Builder and Zarian software. As I said earlier, please, if you have any questions, we encourage you to ask them and we'll be able to answer them during the broadcast. This second poll I like to launch before we get into the form building is just a, a quick survey about your level of expertise within the platform. Uh, for those of you who are checking it out, obviously I expect you to have never used it. For, for those of you who have a trial, you have access to build your own forms and then current customers as well. It's always good to gauge how strong your form building skills are. Uh, so that again, we're able to assess the, the, the audience and then tailor the content to that. While we let these votes come in, I can tell you that today's webinar is going to be going through a broad range of different topics. The form that we're actually building is a relatively simple form, but I'm going to be going through a lot of the nuances in terms of how to build this at an efficient rate, and then also some advanced tips for everyone here. I'm going to go ahead and close this poll and share the results. And it looks like we have a, a large number of people who are brand new, never used it. That makes sense to me since we had a, 
good number of people who are in here just checking things out. And then we also have a good amount of people who are beginners. And we have some people who are very confident in their form building skills, saying that they're able to build forms that can do things they could not do on paper. Go ahead and hide these results. And the next thing we're going to do is talk about the format of today's webinar. So in these community form building webinars, what we're doing is we're taking forms that are posted by the community and uh, we'll go through and we'll build them out for you all live. There's a lot of different ways to participate, including asking questions during the webinar. Also register for each of these webinars as they continue forward into 2019. And then also just talk to us about your challenges. You're able to ask questions after the webinar as well. Uh, send us an email, hop on chat, get on the community forums. Uh, basically, any way you can, get a hold of us and we'll be sure to answer whatever questions you have. Now, for today's webinar, we're not going to be going through an actual form that was submitted by a community member. Um, what we've been doing with the team is we've actually been going through this process of trying to figure out ways to make form building a more positive experience, a better experience for our end users. And we've been using this form as a test case to figure out what we can do to improve the form building experience. So this is actually a form that we developed internally. It's a very simple checklist form. This is something that we see come through very frequently. One of the reasons we chose to highlight this form on today's webinar is because it is generic enough, the idea of having a, a checklist of questions with a predefined set of answers, and then it will be able to have the formula techniques applied to a variety of different use cases. So what I want to do is go through the form briefly first so that we can understand what we're looking at, and then I'm going to hop into the form builder and start building this out. In the beginning, at the very top, you'll see I have a full name field here where we're just going to ask for the user's name. We have a date field as well as a location field. Now, in testing, we made this top area very generic because we wanted to allow flexibility of the people testing out the form builder to build the forms in which they, they felt was the best. Uh, so I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to take some creative liberties here as we build out that top portion. The main content of the form here is a list of areas, both work environment as well as emergency equipment. And the idea here is we're going down through this list and checking to make sure that each of these things are safe or potentially they're at risk or they're not applicable, meaning that it's not uh, in the area that we are at. Now there's a fourth column over here on the right side for a reason. The way this form functions is you have to fill out a reason if the area is marked at risk, you'll see that here and here. So we have a reason filled out. Otherwise, we don't need to do that. Finally, at the bottom, we do have tallies for the number of safe, number of at risk, number of not applicable. Now, this is a little forward thinking, looking at uh, doing analytics and registering KPIs based on the data that you're collecting. And so we want to have those numbers readily available. We'll round out the form with a signature element at the very bottom. And then that is it. So what we're going to do here, I'm going to hop over to my browser. And I have two tabs to start. I've logged into my iPhone Builder environment. Let me do a quick refresh to make sure that I haven't timed out. And then I also have the checklist here in a Google Doc. This is mostly so I can copy and paste and build this a little bit quicker on the webinar for everybody. Now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be demonstrating the web forms feature on today's uh, webinar. Normally what I've done in the past is I have my device displayed on my laptop and I mirror it, but today what we'll be doing is going into the data tab and collecting data with web forms. So I'm going to first go into the form builder here and this will open up into another tab and actually what I'm going to do is move this in front just because I like to have a certain arrangement here. What we need to do is create our form. So I'm going to click on this big green create form button and we are going to name our form safety checklist 12 2018 and you'll notice that the table name which is the unique identifier for this form is based on the label that i typed here now what i'd like to do is clean this up a little bit so i'm going to actually disable based on label i'm going to hop in here and clean this up so i'm going to write safety checklist and just leave it at that i can choose an icon for this as well if i would like these are some predefined icons that you're able to use for your forms if you have your own icon that you'd like to use, all you have to do is host it on a public link, and then you paste that link in here in the form URL, and then that will be what is displayed. Let's finish creating this form here, 
And what we're going to do is we're going to begin by adding these three elements here, the name, the date, and the location. Whoops. All right, so let's go ahead and start with the name. Now, what we could do is add this as a text element because what we're going to want is we want the ability for the user to change the value. And so we're going to write in here, full name. And for the dynamic value, this is the smart control that handles the actual input of that element. What I want to do here is default this to the logged in user's name. So you can use the built-in function, iformbuilder.firstName. And then we're going to add a space after that. And then finally, iformbuilder.lastName. Now let's go ahead and save this. And because we have an element added already, we're going to hop over here to our control panel. Now, if you are an existing user, you may be used to the data tab not having any subheadings underneath it. But if you have web forms enabled in your environment, you will now see that there is a view and collect option. We're going to hop down to collect because this is going to open up the new web forms interface. So from here, this is supposed to mimic what you see on the device. We have all the different forms that we've built. I'm going to scroll down and find our safety checklist. And it's going to open up the form. And what you see here is I have my full name. Now what I can do is I can come in here and I could change this if I would like. But the important thing here is it's defaulted to the user's first and last name as it stands currently. Now that we have that, let's go ahead and add in a couple more fields. We want to add in today's date, so we'll use a date element. And we'll call this today's date, and I'm going to call this inspection date. Now, it's a personal preference of mine. I like to keep base and label dis, uh, turned off, mainly because a lot of the times I will name my element something different than the label text itself. If you have a relatively simple form and you like to keep the data column name similar, you can always click base and label so you don't have to enter the two in manually. To default this to today's current date, I'm actually gonna use a technique that we talked about last webinar. I'm gonna use the JavaScript command date with open close parentheses. This is nothing that is iForm Builder related. This is from the JavaScript library. If you are unfamiliar with the form builder and iForm in general, one of our defining features is that we allow you to use JavaScript commands inside of these smart control areas thus giving you really, really high level of flexibility and customization. Let's do a quick save here. And then I'm also gonna add the location element below. So let's call this inspection location. And we'll do another quick save. Now while I'm loading this up, I'm gonna do a quick refresh. That option for the location inside of the test form, again, as I said, was a little bit ambiguous. And that's because what we wanted to do was allow people to build forms different ways. Now, maybe you had a predefined list of stores that you want to pick as far as your location. You may want a regular text entry so that it is more of a free response. But what I wanted to do today was show what the location element looks like on web forms. So when I click confirm current location, it will ask me if I'm allowed to use the device's location, once I allow, what you'll notice is it's gonna pull up a map. This is where our office is. We are in Herndon, Virginia. And then you'll also be able to see the location details. So this is how the location element looks on web forms. And this is what the top part of our checklist inspection is going to look like that we've built so far. So again, I have full name, date, and location. Now the next thing I'm actually gonna do is add the signature element. I wanna leave the middle part for the, the remainder of the webinar. But again, I encourage people, if you have any questions about what I've done so far, absolutely please ask them in the chat. So let's, on the left-hand side here, scroll down to my signature element. I'm going to call this inspector's signature. and then save this and we'll do another quick check to see what this looks like. Now, you may be asking why I'm refreshing this so frequently and checking what I'm doing and saving what I'm doing. The reason is when I build forms, I tend to build them very methodically, one element at a time or a few elements at a time. 
that's mostly because what allows what that allows me to do is find mistakes that I make much quicker. So it's not a question of if you'll make a mistake when it comes to the form building because of the level of customization and the ability to really fine tune everything. Uh, normally you'll make a small oversight here or there, but that's why I always recommend testing. Now, as far as the signature element goes, what I'm gonna do is use my trackpad here. I'm gonna click and draw. So you see, I can write my signature this way if I would like. Click on done and it's confirmed. So that's what the signature looks like. If I click new signature, it's just gonna clear it out. If I'm writing here and I don't like what I wrote, I can clear it as well. So let's go ahead and finish this one up. My digital penmanship is not the best. And we'll just submit this record. So once the record is being submitted, you'll see it does the little uh, synchronization process. And then it's gonna bring us back to our home screen, just like it is on the device normally. So now that we've built out the top part of the form, the bottom part of the form, let's take the majority of the time to build out this middle piece here. Now what's important to note is each one of these rows is gonna have a couple of different fields to it. The first is you have your label naturally. This is going to be a uh, option where you can choose safe, at risk, or not applicable. And then finally, the reason. So what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna take a look at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven selects. So what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to add these in quick sequence. What I'm gonna do is add the first one and I'm gonna click on location to add the select underneath that element. I'm gonna come over here, grab the label, copy, paste, and I'm gonna go ahead and call this Q1. Now, as far as the option list that I'm going to assign, we're gonna jump in here, and because this is an environment where I've built previous forms before, I'm not sure if I have an appropriate option for this, so I don't know if I have a pass fail. It looks like I do. Pass fail is very similar to safe at risk. It doesn't look like I have the exact option list that I would want, so that means we can go ahead and create a new list. I'm gonna call this safe or at risk or not applicable. For these shorter lists, one of the things I like to do is list out the actual options inside the title so it's easier to find. Now, as I'm typing these out, what you'll notice is there's a label as well as a key value. Now, I wanna talk through the differences in each of these. The label is the text that the end user will see on their device. This is also the text that's able to be localized if you have your form in multiple languages. So that's a feature that oftentimes is overlooked. On the other hand, the key value is going to be the data point that's actually stored in the database. So this is a unique identifier. It's also a common uh, character set so that regardless of the localized language, you know which option was chosen. So that's the intention of the key value. Now, oftentimes what will happen is, um, as you saw here, the key value will default to being database friendly, which means everything is lowercase. It also means that characters like the space or like the special character like the forward slash are converted to underscores. And this is very similar to the way the data column name will be modeled after the elements label. However, oftentimes you want the actual label text as the stored value. And in these scenarios, what I recommend doing is actually using the label text as the key value. So when I'm here, I'm like this. And you wanna save. So now what I have is the label and the key value are effectively the same thing. Again, you would be able to localize this text, but this is what will actually be stored. I'm gonna assign my optional list. I'm gonna go up here, do a quick save. And let's take a look at my form. So we'll see here we have the full name, today's date, the location, which I'm gonna skip for now. And then we have this question here, work areas are clean and clear of oil spills. So we can choose safe, at risk, or not applicable. This is what the web forms interface looks like. If I want to deselect 
the choice, I can clear this out. Now the next thing we have to build for this question is what happens when they choose at risk. We want to have a text line that shows underneath asking for an explanation. So we're going to add a text element. I'm going to call this reason. I'm going to write Q1 reason as the name. Now we worked with the dynamic value earlier for today or for the full name of the user. We're going to work with the condition value here for the reason. The purpose of the condition value is to handle the visibility of the element. So what that means is inside the condition value, we're going to put a statement in. And if that statement evaluates to true, then the element will be shown. If it evaluates to false, the element will be hidden. This is going to allow the forms to have what's called skip logic or, or business logic in terms of where you're navigating along the forms. So what I want to do is I want to check for Q1 if the option chosen was at risk. So I'm going to look for the key value. So you see display key of Q1. And I want to make sure and check to see if it's equal to at risk. And so what this means is if I chose at risk, this will be true. This will show. Let's go ahead and save this. And do another quick check. And we'll see down here, if I choose safe, we're good. If I choose at risk, we have this reason show up. And if I choose not applicable, nothing shows here. So this is an example of our skip logic. Now, the next step is going to be to build out the remaining portion of this top section. So what I'm actually going to do is add one, two, three, four, five, six new sets of the elements that we did previously. So even though I've gone very slowly so far, at this point, what I'm going to want to do is add this element multiple times. Let's go ahead and do a duplicate real quick. I'm going to flip the order here. So this is now underneath. This is effectively Q2, which is this question. Let's get rid of these spaces here in the label. And you'll notice because I duplicated it, I have that same option defaulted as what was chosen. So this is going to allow me to build these pretty quickly. I can go in here and I need a few more of these. So I added a whole bunch. We'll delete what's necessary afterwards. But I've done hallways are free of obstructions. Now let's check emergency and safety. This is Q3. Q4, Q5, Q6, and it looks like I was almost exact on this one. One more, Q7. Okay. I'm going to take this last one, just go ahead and delete it. And let's save this and see what it looks like. Okay. Let's hop over to my web form. And what we should see here is a list of selects underneath. And this looks really good here. So we'll see each of the different labels. We have the different options below it. Now we'll check this top one again, so we'll see the reason shows up. For these, naturally, it does not. And that is because we haven't added those text elements afterwards. So now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to hop over to my table view. I really like this view for editing multiple elements. Uh, I tend to use the first view, the device view, for adding all my elements. And then I come in here and configure them afterwards. Now, we were working with the condition value before. So I'm going to show that column. You'll see it right here. And what I want to do is uh, I'm going to actually take this element and I'm going to duplicate it a few times and move the spacing. Let's hop over here, actually. I think I can do it faster with this view. So let's take my reason and we'll just drag it down underneath each one of these. So we want to have them alternating. All right. 
Uh, hey, Lisa, I noticed that uh, it looks like we have a question that came in. While I'm doing these quick configurations, do you want to let us know what the question was and I can answer it? Yes, yeah, so the question was, um, can you show one more time how you start the validation page? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm hoping that what they mean by the validation page is the list view. If not, just uh, go ahead and correct me and I'll be able to take a look at that. But what I've done here so far is I have select text, select text. I'm going to have a whole sequence of these. And now what I'm able to do is up here in the upper left corner, there are three icons. Normally your screen looks like this actually. I'm going to click on the far right one. It looks like an ordered list. It'll show me the list view. This is going to default to giving me the label, the name, and the data type. Clicking on this more drop down, I'm going to choose condition value because that's what I'm interested in modifying currently. And you'll see here that I have my condition value duplicated for each one of these. Now, all this means is I need to now change the label, the key value, and then the number here. So we're going to do this. This one is good. So this one will still just say reason. But instead of saying Q1 reason, this should be Q2 reason. Okay, and this is checking for Q2. This should be Q3 reason. This is the Q4 reason. And while I'm doing this, I do want to talk through what I'm uh, what I'm actually typing and pressing. Uh, as I go to each line, because it's selected by default, I'm actually going to type out reason quickly. What I have on my clipboard is Q2 reason. So all I have to do is go back in here and change this number briefly. And then all I have to do on this side is modify my condition value to match. I actually did notice I wrote down an A here. So quick looking out here. A lot of the times those are the types of mistakes you'll, you'll make and they're hard to find when you're debugging. So as you see on a live broadcast, even I make these mistakes pretty frequently. We'll do Q6 over here. We'll do Q7. Okay, and that looks good to me. You'll notice all the fields I changed have a yellow background. It's an easy visual indicator to know that changes were made. Let me save this. And it looks like we saved everything correctly. And let's hop back over to Web Forms. And as I refresh this, we'll take a look. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and do save at risk. Oh, reason popped up. Perfect. If I click not applicable, nothing happens. If I click at risk, oh, we got another reason. Safe, and I'm going to go down here and just finish these up. Perfect. All right, uh, Lisa, it looks like another question may have come through. Yes. So the question was, what's the difference between a select element and an option list element? Real good question, and this is a, it's actually an issue of terminology, and so let me go ahead and back up my language a little bit, reiterate, and hopefully clear this up. So an option list is actually not an element. When I say element, what I'm talking about is a field on your form. An option list is a predefined list of values that you create separate from your form. So if I, in fact, go up to the top here, I have a form section. And an option list section. Option lists, as I see here, okay, I'm going to scroll down to the one I had before, are a predefined set of values. So I make an option list. Now the cool thing about this is I can say, hey, I want this option list to be in a whole bunch of different forms. I can give you an example. I know I have a yes, no option list down here. My, uh, my prediction here is that this is actually part of a few forms. So I'm gonna click up here on my dependencies button. Oh, I was wrong actually. So this yes, no is only shown or used in my international registration form in the child, the household employed form. So this is the dependencies tree to let me know where my assets are being used. Going back to the terminology question though, your option list is separate from a form. It's not an element, it's its own entity, it's its own object. So I make my option list. now. How do I use that option list? There's a few different ways to use it. What we did so far is we used it in a select element. 
the select element shows up like this, where you have a few different choices. And then you click on the one you want. It's inline is the word I use to describe a select element. What I'm going to do to illustrate the difference is I'm going to take my bottom select and I'm going to change the element type to a pick list. Pick list is another option based element, meaning it's an element that uses an option list to display its values. And I'm going to take this other one and turn this into a multi select, which is the third and final option based element. As I save this and reload, we'll talk through the differences. So what I have here, you'll notice these two have changed. I have my select still here, it's in line. I can go boom, boom, boom. It's real fast to fill out. Now let's say I have a longer list. Your pick list is gonna show up as a drop down menu. And so this is really nice if you have to scroll through a lot of options. Maybe you have a list of countries or a list of locations or sites. You use a pick list to show that. Again, this doesn't change the options inside of the option list at all. All this does is it changes the display on the data collection tool. So this is my pick list, I choose one. You'll notice the logic function is just the same. In contrast, a multi-select is gonna show this way. And you'll notice the checkboxes, and this is because, as its name states, a multi-select allows you to choose more than one option. So this is what the multi-select will look like. So I hope that answered the question about the difference between a select and an option list. They're not, um, it's not an either or, it's that your option list is its own entity. Again, a predefined list or set of values. The select element is one mechanism to display the option list to be used to make a choice. Lisa, did we have any other questions other than that? No, those are the only questions we've received. Perfect. So let's jump back in here. Let's go ahead and change these back real quickly. Now, for those of you who are seasoned form builders, uh, you may have run into this before. I know I have, um, where changing the element type can cause some data loss issues. I want to draw everyone's attention to this red warning sign right here. Uh, whether you know about it or not, it never hurts to reinforce this. Making certain changes to your form structure basically can't be handled gracefully on the database side of things. And so what will end up happening is we'll have data loss issues. To get medium technical, the database column on the back end cannot be modified as such. And so what happens is it gets deleted and recreated. Hence, any data in that column is lost as a result. Now, changing the element type, which was this whole select, multi-select pick list, the data size, for a text element, you'll see that's the number of characters I can enter. Or the encryption, meaning that this element is encrypted on the database. Changing either of those three options is gonna cause data in that column to be deleted. So just be really careful with those three things. Um, I changed these without much hesitation or any problem, primarily because I haven't collected any data, so it's not a big deal. But if this was a live form, I'd have to be more careful about this and use certain techniques that we've gone through in other webinars to make that change without losing data. Okay, so now that my form is back where it is, I actually am not going to be going through this final set of elements here. I just wanna make sure in the interest of time, we're able to get to this part here, which is honestly, uh, it may seem like a very small detail in terms of form building, but this can be a challenging component of the form building, especially if you're not too familiar with JavaScript. And so what I'm going to be doing is showing you all an easy way to add these counts together. Now, the reason it's easy is because I've already done the hard work here and written the page level JavaScript function for everybody. So I'm going to show you how to implement this function so you can use it on your forms as well. Now, what we need to do is I'm going to hop over here, and this is the function I have. It doesn't look like it's a whole lot, but it does a good amount. Let me copy this very briefly, and I'm going to show you where to insert this in the form. So far, we've worked with different elements with the dynamic value and condition value. These are on a per element basis, but what I want to do is actually apply some JavaScript to the entire form. To do that, at the upper right corner, you'll see these double curly braces, and clicking on this is going to bring up my page level JavaScript editor. This is where I'm able to write some JavaScript commands, and these will be usable by any element on my form. Now, a couple of important Highlights to this function, 
The name of the function is count if. I'm actually going to copy that to my clipboard very quickly. The way this function works is it's going to have two values that you have to give it. What's called an array or a list. And then it's going to have an option that it's looking for. And just to give you a brief rundown of how the function actually works, it's going to loop through my list of elements or values that I give it. And it's going to check to see if they match my option. And if they do, then it's going to increment a count. And finally, it'll say how many of these values match what I was looking for in the option. And that's the number it will return. Now, if that didn't make sense, don't worry about it. I'm going to go through the implementation and hopefully that will clear things up. And if not, again, you're able to ask questions at any time. I'm going to come down here towards the bottom of my form and I'm going to add a read only element. Now, the difference between a read only element compared to a text element is that the read only cannot be modified. And so for things like calculations, uh, the read only element is the appropriate choice because you don't want somebody changing the value of this calculated field. I'm going to call this count of safe because what we're going to be doing is checking how many safe options were selected. Let's call this count safe. Now, if you remember from earlier in the broadcast, we have a dynamic value and a condition value. The dynamic value controls the input. The condition value can, is going to be responsible for the visibility. So because we want to change the formula for what is displayed in this element, we'll be going to the dynamic value. Now to implement my page level JavaScript function, I'm going to paste in the function name. And if you remember, I have two things I need to give it. I need to first give it a list of values, and I'm going to enclose that list in square brackets. The second thing is I need a value that I'm comparing it to. Now what I'm going to be doing here is comparing it to the value 0. And if you're unsure why I'm doing that, I'm going to go ahead and explain it in a minute. But the next thing I want to do here is inside of my square brackets, my list, I want to pass Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, Q5, Q6, Q7. I believe those were all we had. Yep. Okay. So what I have done here now is I have a list of values I'd like to give my function and the value I will be comparing it to. Now the reason we're using zero is if I go to this select element and I go back to my option list, you'll see this option list is displayed. There's three different properties here. I have a sort order, a label, and a key value. So far we worked with the key value. We did that zc display a key command. But in this scenario, what I want to do is actually compare it to the index or the sort order. And if I use the data column name by default, that is the value that is passed. And so here I'm going to check to see if the index is zero for safe. Now, if I want to check at risk, it'll be a one. If I want to check not applicable, it'll be a two. But we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. Let me make sure that I've saved this. And let's hop back over here and see if my page level JavaScript function worked or if I made a small error when I was doing my form building. I'm going to scroll down here. We see kind of safe has no values in it yet. Now what happens if I choose these? So it looks like nothing is showing up. So we have some debugging to do, which is perfect. Okay. Now a couple of things I'm looking at, if you've gone through this form building process before, you'll know what I'm, I'm doing. Because I don't have a value in here, my first thought is that the function is not evaluating correctly. So what I'm actually going to do is hop up here, make sure I save this. This is a pretty common mistake. So we'll save our page level JavaScript. And now what I'm going to do is close this and refresh one more time. I'm actually going to do a hard refresh. And we'll check again. Now what I'm going to do is I'm not going to bother filling it out if it doesn't look correct to begin with. We'll see a zero here. So now I think that we're on the right track. Uh, because the function is doing a count, there's none chosen right now. If I click on save, this is good. We have a one, two, three, four, five. Let's see at risk. The number didn't go up. What if I change one of these? The number decreases. We're looking good here. So it looks like my page level function worked. 
I can fill out a reason, and then I would be able to submit this record. So let's go ahead and round out our implementation. Let's go ahead and do the count for at risk as well as not applicable. We're gonna have another two read-only fields. I'm gonna say count at risk. And I'm going to take my dynamic value from before, copy, paste, and instead of comparing for index of zero, I want index of one. Oops. And then similarly here, I want index of two. Let me change my label real quick. Count and A. And I can do a quick save here. And I'll do another refresh. Let's take a look at our form. We'll see the three different counts here. Let's do a real quick check off the bottom. So this is good. This is good. Now let's go up here and let's fill out this form a little bit. Okay. So we have all safe except for one not applicable, two not applicable, one at risk. Looks good. We have one at risk, two not applicable. The remainder are safe. And so I have my counts for my form. So again, one of the nice things about the page level JavaScript is I only had to write this function one time. Once I wrote it one time, I was able to use it down below in my form repeatedly. Now I know earlier I said, uh, if you have any questions about this, if this is a little bit confusing, hopefully it makes a little bit more sense now. Uh, I'm gonna go back to and, and talk through that again. If this is confusing for you, absolutely please ask us a question, let us know. Um, but again, the page level JavaScript function will be made available for you so you're able to implement it in your forms a little bit more easily. Now, before we go ahead and summarize today's webinar, I did wanna launch a quick poll here. Uh, going through the page level JavaScript function I wrote, uh, this is a relatively you know, lower barrier of entry than having to write it yourself, just being able to share the knowledge. But again, we're always looking to improve. What I wanted to do was ask everybody in the audience here with respect to your own forms, your own data collection needs, would a built-in function to count the occurrences of an option be helpful? So something where you don't have to copy and paste the page level JavaScript, you don't have to do anything like that. You're able to maybe specify just the options value that you want to count within the form, and it'll return the number. Now, if this is gonna be really helpful in your forms, maybe you're not as comfortable writing JavaScript, then that would be really great to know. Uh, if you don't have anything like this in your forms and having a count of the options won't be helpful, then please let us know that as well. It's really good feedback. And then maybe if this is something that would be helpful, but you're comfortable, so you know it's not going to be super helpful, then answer in that way as well. All right, we've got a couple more seconds. Let a few of these votes trickle in. And I'm going to go ahead and close my poll, share my results real quickly. Looks like the majority of people here find a page level function, or not a page level function, I'm sorry, I misspoke, would find a built-in function to count the option occurrences very helpful. Some of you are saying it'd be somewhat helpful, that's really great feedback, and some of you are saying it wouldn't be helpful, and that's also really good to know. Uh, Lisa, real quickly, I want to check in, are there any questions that have come through so far? Um, John, no, we didn't receive any more questions. All right. Then what I will be doing now is I'm going to hop back over here to my slides, and I want to go ahead and recap everything that has been done today. So let's talk through some of these different features here. Um, in terms of best practices and strategies, uh, it's always great to be able to find a way to create a generic option list. So for example, pass fail, yes, no, male, female, uh, pass fail, not applicable. These are option lists that you're going to be able to use throughout multiple forms, multiple times. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to, one, save time, save work. But actually, there's a more important value added here, and that is the point of data consistency. If you have a form, like my checklist, where I have similar choices that have to be made, 
having one option list is going to ensure that the data collection is homogenous. It's going to make sure that all the options, all the values are the same. And that's going to make it a lot easier to do analytics visualizations later on. Now, my next best practice is that your data feed is going to export key values. I touched on that very briefly. But if you have exported the data feeds before and you saw the key values, which are lowercase in your Excel file, um, what I would recommend doing is what I did in today's webinar, which was take your label text and copy it over to the key value. My third best practice is to use your iPhone Builder built-in functions. Today, what I did was I used first name and last name. We also talked about and did that quick poll about a potential new built-in function for counting options. And so the feedback there was really great. I'm going to take that back to the team, and then we'll see what we can do with that moving forward. I'm going to skip my fourth best practice here because it's the final thing I'm going to be doing on the webinar. But jumping down to number five, uh, you want to use a page-level JavaScript function to perform repeated operations. A lot of the times, this is the way the maturity of the technology happens, where we find somebody who writes a really awesome page-level JavaScript function. And what we're going to do from there is take that function, flesh it out, mature it a little bit, and then we can work towards moving it into a built-in function so it's standard and it's generic. Now, this fourth best practice, using the assigned to element to pass a record, I'm going to add this in my form very quickly here. This is the last element I wanted to add. The assigned to element is going to allow me to take that record and pass it to a new user. Now, the reason I didn't do this earlier is because it's kind of hard to demonstrate on a single screen. But what I'm going to say here is select a manager. And what I want is I want this form or this field to only show up if count at risk is greater than zero. Whoops. I'm getting crossed here. So if count at risk is greater than zero, this element will show. Let me do a quick save here and show you what that means. While I'm doing that, Lisa, did something else come in through chat? Yes. So um, someone is asking, is there a way to populate a list from a SQL table? Oh, good question. And that's something that we've heard before in the past. Uh, yes, it is possible. So uh, that's not something that's like built into the, the form builder. But if you're looking at having workflows where you have a, a SQL table and you want to populate an option list based on those values, it's something that we'd have to look at on an individual basis because there's a lot of uh, variables and configurations that could be possible there. There's no generic built-in solution to iPhone Builder currently in terms of populating option lists, except for building them manually or doing a CSV upload. Let me do a quick refresh on my form now. And what we should see here is there is no assigned to element. As soon as I pick at risk for one of these, though, you're going to see this select a manager pop up. And this is going to be where you can choose a different user who you want to submit this record to. So all that would happen is if I chose, for example, webinars, which is actually the user I'm signed in as right now. If I submit this, what that means is the record is actually assigned back to me. But the use case here is you may want to assign that to a supervisor or to a manager. Now, because I assigned the record to myself, you'll see here it's on my assigned record list. If I was a controller sitting back in the office and somebody had assigned a record to me, I'm able to come in here, open this record. It's going to populate the form with the data that was submitted previously. Let's see here. And then I'm able to make an assessment on it. Maybe I want to go ahead and QA, verify something here. Maybe they entered in something wrong. I can change it. But then ultimately what I can do is submit this record, and then it's just being stored in the database afterwards at this point. But again, that opens up a small little workflow for you if you want to mess around with it. Uh, go ahead and try it out. If you have any questions on how you may want to implement that, also feel free to reach out to us about that as well. All right. I want to thank everybody for joining today's webinar. I've got one last poll for everybody. Uh, this is the last poll, and this is the poll that we always close the webinar out with. But again, I just want to get some real quick, real-time feedback about the form building level of difficulty during the webinar. My goal here is always to make sure that the form building falls within these two middle options here. I want to make sure that if you're a more advanced form builder, this is a good, comfortable review. Or if you are a newer form builder, hopefully you learned something new is challenging, but it was informative and you were able to follow along. Looks to me like we did a great job today, Lisa. The majority of the votes here.
-hmm. are saying that people had a comfortable, good review during this webinar. And we have some people who thought it was challenging but informative. Given the fact that we had a lot of brand new viewers and people on trials, I would say that is an excellent success. So uh, if you guys have any questions that come up throughout the next couple of days, a lot of times the form building comes in, it's really comfortable, and then the next day you lose some of it. But if you have questions, follow up with us. As I said earlier in the broadcast, we're going to be releasing the recording on YouTube so you're able to go back and reference it. Uh, from everyone here at Zarian Software, thank you guys so much for a year of community form building webinars. We really appreciate all of the viewership and hope you all have a great holiday season. Don't forget to tune in for the form building webinar, or not the form building, the web forms webinar next week. Uh, that's going to be a really great webinar. If you want to learn more about how to use web forms, that's the place to be. Again, this is Jonathan Sue with Lisa Smith over here. And from Zarian Software, thank you all so much and have a great rest of your day. Bye, everybody.